Well, good morning, church. Let's go ahead, let's stand, and let's worship our God. Let's sing this together. Blessed are those who run to him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. And blessed are those who seek his face, who bend their knees on Jesus they won't be shaken and come on in pray
Yeah, make some noise. Let's go. Thank the Lord. It's a good time to be alive. Amen. God is so good. Well, happy Palm Sunday. You guys may be seated. Uh, my name is Chase Corey. I serve here with our student ministry team. And uh, man, it's just a joy to be in the house of the Lord. We got an awesome week this week and a great week next week with Easter and 
This is Palm Sunday. I'm, I'm thrilled that Pastor Joseph is going to kind of walk us through Palm Sunday and what that means and get into the details of that. But I want to read this verse. This is a verse um, in Luke 19, uh, verse 38. It says this. The disciples were saying, as Jesus rode in on the donkey on uh, Palm Sunday, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What I love about that verse, they say, blessed is the king. A lot of people thought Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom. But what he really did was establish an eternal kingdom. And that's good news. That's what we celebrate today. And so this week, Palm Sunday, the beginning of this week, was the most impactful week in human history. And we're starting that, um, or that reflection uh, this Sunday. And so let me pray for us, and we'll get into the word. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for your kindness, your faithfulness to us, for being gracious when we don't deserve it, for a compassionate heart towards us, Lord. Lord, I thank you that we're all gathered in this place and we can freely worship your, your name. God, would you set our hearts on you, Jesus? Would every distraction, every anxious thought, every feeling that's self-centered, whatever it is, God, that we'd lay it down to set our mind and our gaze upon you. We love you. Speak to us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Welcome to this place. I'm glad that you're here with us as we gather, certainly those of you who are in this room, but we've also got people over in the West Wing. We've got people that are viewing online, and we all gather around God's Word in this moment together as the people of God, and I'm just grateful that we have the opportunity and the technology to be able to do that together. Well, we, as uh, Chase just reminded us, are heading in um, to Easter. And so I just want to encourage you, uh, we've given you cards to invite. Uh, this is the first Easter in a long time that we're not contending with Master's Week. And so, man, use this. I, I believe with all my heart that God has ordained moments for you with your friends and your relationships. I believe that God has placed you in the, the businesses and the schools and the neighborhoods, and He wants to use you to draw people to himself. And this is an easy way uh, that you can do that and that you can take part just simply to invite someone. And so we want to make sure that you do that. Secondly, I want to let you know something about uh, something that's really important that just hasn't got a lot of airtime because we've had so many other things that we're juggling. Uh, but today we have a foster care interest meeting um, that's going to happen right after this service back in the Kids at Warren wing. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but we have an incredible ministry to foster care families. Our foster care system is, is something that struggles, is something that needs a lot of help. It's, I believe, one of the greatest opportunities for the church to minister in the community. And so we've got families on all four campuses who have invited foster kids into their homes. And what our foster care ministry does is that they build teams of people around those families to help support them. And so you can be a part of a team that brings a meal once a month, that uh, can get certified to keep their children. Uh, sometimes we just need men with trucks that can transport supplies and beds to different locations. But what I'm saying is that you don't have to be in the stage of life that you open your home to a child, but you can really pray and support uh, those who are. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do that right after the service. Go. It'll be a relatively quick meeting. I think they're going to feed you. Um, but I promise you it will be well worth your time and just a way that together we can make a difference in this community. We always ask ourselves, if Warren Grove Town ceased to exist, would the community that we are in notice? And I think the answer to that is a really important answer. And this is a way that we can make sure 
that they do. Well, today, as we gather in this place, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is a very special Sunday because it marks the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And it kicks off the final days of his life and his ministry, as well as leads into his conviction and crucifixion, his burial, and ultimately we celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And so this is, a, this is an important week. This is a, a, a sacred week in the life of a believer. And so today, we want to use this Sunday as a means by which we begin to fix our hearts on Jesus. We're going to take communion today together. And we want to use this so that we not just arbitrarily go through the motions of Easter, but, but we intentionally fix our hearts on our Savior. And, and that we let this be a journey of our heart and our soul as much as it, as it is a practice in our society and in our community. And so, in that vein, I want to prepare your hearts for that today. If you will, turn with me in your Bible to Mark chapter 15. And we're going to be in verses 15 through 39 today. And we're going to use this as a launching point as we head toward Easter. And as you're turning there, let me ask you this question. Have you ever found yourself in a situation that you didn't plan to be in and that you necessarily didn't want to be in? Anybody ever been there? Uh, I don't know what that situation might have been. Uh, maybe it was in traffic, maybe it was a moment in a relationship, but what we find is that sometimes in life, we find ourselves in situations unintentionally that we neither planned or wanted to be part of. I think about the popular show on ABC Primetime called What Would You Do? Have you ever watched that show? Yes. It's a hidden camera show, but really it's a social experiment, isn't it? They send actors in, they set up this awkward situation. I, don't, I, I get uncomfortable watching it. I'm just like, oh my gosh. But, it, but it's usually something that's illegal or racial or some sort of conflict and tension. And, and you have all of these people that are out in public. They're just going to the coffee shop. They're just going to the restaurant that they frequent. And all of a sudden, whether they wanted to be or not, they are participants in a situation, and little do they know, a TV show that they never intended on being a part of. They're in a situation that they never asked to be part of. And so that's exactly what happens to a certain man in the city of Jerusalem in the first century in Mark chapter 15. And what we see is that this man is accidentally swept up in arguably the most polarizing, crucial, and certainly most biblically significant event in all of human history. And so let's pick up the story. In verse 15, the Bible reads this, Mark chapter 15, verse 15. It says, So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him, Jesus, away inside the palace. That is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion. A battalion was anywhere from 400 to 600 soldiers. So they were expecting a crowd. And they clothed him in purple. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him and say, Hail, the king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. They were mocking him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And here they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross and they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And so let me set the scene for us here 
today. I, I, I don't want you to miss it. Jesus has been betrayed by one of his closest friends. Subsequently, he's arrested. He's brought before the Jewish leadership, and they, they desire to kill him. And so they come to the Roman government at that time, and they trump up these charges, and he goes from governor to governor. Finally, he lands in front of Pilate. Now, now Pilate doesn't find anything wrong with him, and he really doesn't want to do anything with Jesus. He wants to release him, but the crowds are ruthless, and they demand that he release Barabbas and execute Jesus. And so to pacify the crowd, this is exactly what Pilate does. And so what we find in these opening passages is the account of the events of, of this day in the gospel and the book of Mark. Now, I want to give you a little context for this book because I, I believe that it's important. There is someone that once said, text without context is a pretext for error. That's something that we believe in this place, something that we need to cling to. Any sort of biblical text without the proper context is always a pretext for error and bad theology. So let me give you some context here regarding the gospel and the book of Mark. It was written by a man named John Mark. And John Mark historically is known to be the attendant and the companion of the apostle Peter. And so when you're reading the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, what you need to be aware of is that you are reading Peter's account of these things. Now this is important because in order for a text to be included in the New Testament, it had to meet three qualifications. This isn't just some random book that was accepted later. This is something that was evaluated and found to have met three qualifications. The first, these texts had to be of apostolic origin. Apostolic origin. And so we know the book of Mark meets that. While Mark wasn't an apostle himself, he was an attendant of Peter. And what we know through history is that this book is widely accepted as Peter's account. Secondly, a text to be included in the New Testament had to be accepted as scripture by the first century church. Again, not something that was decided later. These books were considered the canon of scripture in the first century. Why is that important? Well, it's important because many of the first century believers were eyewitnesses themselves. Some of them eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry. Many of them eyewitnesses to the apostles. So if anyone could smell a fake, it would have been the first century church. And they often did, and they often rejected many writings that claimed to be Scripture. And so what we want to know all these years later is that this was accepted by them, and Mark was. Finally, what we know is that in order for a passage in a book and a text to be accepted as New Testament Scripture, it had to be in perfect alignment with the doctrine and the verbal teachings of both Jesus and the apostles. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. And so... In order for it to be inspired and errant scripture, it had to be in alignment. And what we see historically is that the book of Mark and all of the Gospels meet all of these very stringent qualifications. This is important because as we look at this account of Jesus and his sacrifice, his person and work, what we can know is that this isn't just some sort of religious creation, but this is historical fact. It is trustworthy in its documentation. And so we can stand on that firm foundation. And so as we open the pages and we look into the story, what we see are Peter's accounts of the events of Jesus' conviction, torture, and crucif crucifixion. Crucifixion. I made up a word there. That was like Bush back in the day. Crucifixion. <clears throat> but we, would, we know that Peter was there. We know that he was following Jesus. He was present. And so we get, we get his view. 
And he is like all of the gospel writers. Each of the gospel writers tell the story. And we get this story, different details of the same account. And this is, this is a powerful witness. I want you to imagine that four of us witnessed a car wreck. What are the police officers going to do? Well, they're going to come and they want all four of our statements. And each of us saw the same thing, but we saw it from a different vantage point. And so our details will vary, but as we give a different perspective and picture of the same event, the police are going to be able to put together the full picture of exactly what happens. And that's what we have in the four canonical Gospels. And so we see all four Gospels talk about this event. Each one of them reflect the physical, the emotional, the political, and the spiritual tensions and struggles that surrounded this fateful march and this fateful moment. And what we know from all four is this, that this was not the regal parade that our king and our master was due. We've seen Jesus in the book of Revelation. We know that he is due all honor and glory, that he's worthy to judge, that he's worthy of all praise in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. And what we see is that he is not getting that due in this moment. In fact, it's the opposite. It's not a regal reception, but it is a ghastly and public and sadistic scene. Now, if you'll remember, this is exactly the opposite of what happened just a few days prior. In John chapter 21, we see the account of Jesus entering the city. And at that moment, the city loved him. The Bible tells us that they lined the streets, that they waved palm branches, that they cheered Hosanna, which means save us. And they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These people were, were looking for an earthly ruler. They were hoping that, that Jesus would come to deliver them from the Roman occupation and oppression. And when they realized that he wasn't, they turned on him. And things got ugly quickly. And so this is the scene. Chaos, injustice, mob-like rage and brutality. So far from what the king of kings deserved. And so we see the scene. The next thing that I want you to notice is the shame. What I want you to see is that this, this was a very public execution and mocking. And what I want you to understand is that it was designed to be that way. The Roman government wanted this to be a spectacle. Jesus had been stripped. He had been severely injured. He had been forced to carry his own instrument of torture and death. The crowds in the street were gathered. They were watching. They were jeering. And this was all by design. This was meant to be a public parade of mockery and a display of shame for all to see. What we know in history is that victims of crucifixion, they were meant to be objects of ridicule. And this was intentional to send a message to the community. It was a message about the power of Rome and the consequences for breaking its laws. And so Jesus, who had no guilt, was marked for death he was marched to the place of execution and he was mocked callously every step of the way and when i see that picture i just think man what restraint he had you see the bible says that jesus he upholds the world and the universe by the word of his power so understand this at any moment, with a word, he could have made those nails dissolve out of his hands. He could have come down just like they were, they were telling him to. He upholds the, the very particles of, of the very hearts and lungs that were keeping all of those people mocking and jeering him al alive. And in a moment, with a word, he could have ended their life just like that. And yet, 
He restrained that power. He endured the mocking. He endured the torture and the shame. Why? For you and I. You see, he knew that we were sinners. He came to die for his enemies, of which you and I were. And he knew that if he did not endure, that we were hopeless without his death, burial, and resurrection. And so he endured and he restrained all power for your sake and mine. And so we see the scene, we see the shame, a public parade. And then all of a sudden in this story, we find a selection. Verse 21, we meet a man named Simon. And what we see, as we've said, Simon finds himself in a very serious situation that he did not intend to be in. The Bible tells us very quickly that he was coming into the city from the country. He would have been making his way in to the city with hundreds of other pilgrims so that he could celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. It was the time of the Passover. He was there to, to walk through and to honor and to worship Jesus. And as he stepped into the cities of Jerusalem... What we find is that all of a sudden he's swept up in a crowd. And maybe you've experienced this if you've ever been to the let out of a concert or a, or a ball game. And maybe your car's over there, but like masses of people are heading this way. There is no going that direction. You've got to go this direction until you can make your way back around. That was the environment. And so we, we find Simon, he's making his way in for one thing, and all of a sudden he becomes swept up in something altogether that he did not expect. It says the Roman guard grabbed him and compelled him. Now that word compelled is not a friendly, pretty please, would you, sir? That compelled is a you better or else. The Roman guards at any point could end your life. You know, we, they did not enjoy the kind of freedoms and protections that we have here in this country. And so if you crossed a Roman guard, it could be the end. And so Simon was compelled. He was compelled to carry the cross. Now the question is why? Why would the soldiers compel him to do that? Well, make no mistake, these men didn't all of a sudden gain a conscience. These men didn't all of a sudden in this process become compassionate toward their victim. What we have to understand is that these Roman guards, they were trained and calculated killers. And it was their job to make sure that this painful death did not end prematurely. You see, their goal was when they, they beat him, to beat him within an inch of their life, but... They also wanted him to not give out on the way. They needed him to last so that they could get him on the cross and so that the torture could be fully realized. It wasn't compassion. It, it, it was a scientific brutality that they were experts in carrying out. And so Simon was made to carry the cross. Now, he wouldn't have carried the whole thing. It would have been the crossbar. What we understand from history is that the crossbar weighed about 30 to 40 pounds. So it wasn't unbearable. But what you have to understand is that Jesus would have been so severely weakened from the beating. His skin and muscles would have been severely lacerated. Often with the Roman flogging, there was internal organ damage. And he would have lost so much blood that 30 to 40 pounds could have could have really killed him. The ESV commentary comments on Roman flogging. It says Roman flogging was a horrifically cruel punishment. Those condemned to it were tied to a post and beaten with a leather whip that was interwoven with pieces of bone and metal, which tore through skin and tissue, often exposing bones and even intestines. In many cases, the flogging itself was fatal. The Romans scourged Jesus nearly to death so that he would not 
remain alive on the cross after sundown. And so you can see it was this balance. Near death, but not dead. And they were, they were carefully orchestrating the way that it would all come out. Precise. Scientific. And so as we read this account, we see that Simon of Cyrene was a man who unwittingly was quite literally thrust into the very heart of the gospel story. And it, it must have been frightening. The tensions were high. This was like a mob. The Romans were involved. It was very dangerous. It must have been something that he would have been nervous about, reluctant to be part of. And yet, he was compelled to carry the cross of this condemned man named Jesus. We see this account of Simon in, in three of the four Gospels. Matthew 27, 32, it echoes the fact that he was a man of Cyrene. Cyrene was a Roman province on the north coast of Africa. It would have been in modern-day Libya. And so what we know from history is that this was a region that had a large Jewish population. And so most likely, Simon was a converted Jew. He was an African who had made a trip to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. One commentator said it this way. He says, we do not know, we do know of men from Cyrene being among those converted at Pentecost. After the martyrdom of Stephen, believers from Cyrene were among the first to be scattered by the persecution in Jerusalem. Arriving in Antioch, they preached to the Gentiles there. And these believers were instrumental in the formation of the church at Antioch, where for the first time the disciples were called Christians in Acts eleven twenty six. And so this was a man. He was an African man. And he was there to celebrate the Passover. Mark 15 adds another detail that's pretty interesting and just adds to the humanity of, of Simon. It, it adds that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now this is interesting that Mark would add this detail because if you know Mark, Mark is a man of very few words. He, he's kind of a dude's dude. He only gives you like the bare minimum information. Anybody in the room have a husband like I'm just kidding, don't raise your hand. He was a dude's dude. What takes Luke like a page, he just will like summarize in a sentence. That's, that's how Mark wrote. And yet, what we find is that he adds this detail. That he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why? Well, the fact that he just names him and, and, and rattles off these other names tells us that Simon may have become a significant figure in the early church in Rome. What we know is that Peter was in Rome. It's believed that this gospel could have been written in Rome. And when you turn to Rome, Romans chapter 16, verse 13, we see that there was a man named Rufus in the early church account. And so Simon was there accidentally, but God meant this as a divinely ordained appointment. Just a moment, just a sentence in the story, and yet conceivably, this could be a moment that changed Simon's life forever. It could have changed the trajectory of his, his family and his legacy. And so we see that in, in Mark. Luke chapter 23, the other gospel that tells this story, adds one other detail that's important. It says that he was compelled to carry the cross, and he was going to carry it behind Jesus. In other words, Simon would have followed Jesus to the cross all the way. He would have felt the jeering of the crowd. He would have felt the weight of the cross beam. His shirt would have been wet with the very blood that unbeknownst to him was being shed for his sins and the sins of all of the world. And so he was ushered into a moment that he never intended to be part of. We see the scene, we see the shame, we've witnessed the selection. And finally, I want to look at discernment. What can we learn? What's the lesson that we're 
to take away. It's one sentence, easy to pass over this character and story. But, but I believe that Simon's example is a pivotal and a powerful example for anyone who would follow Jesus. And so what are we to take away today? Number one, what I want you to see here is that following Jesus always involves a crucifixion. Not just the crucifixion of our Savior, but it is daily the crucifixion of the self, the death of the self. You see, in the same way that Simon bore the cross and followed Jesus to Golgotha, Jesus says that this is the call for every single one of us who would be his disciple. Mark 8, 34 says, if anyone would come after me, this is Jesus talking, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And so what we find is that Simon's situation is a beautiful illustration for our call as disciples. And we've got to be sure that our lives don't cheapen that. That our theology doesn't counterfeit what it really means to follow Jesus. You see, following Jesus doesn't mean that you'll always be healthy, wealthy, and happy in this life. We know that our destiny is that for eternity. We've seen that in Revelation. But right now what it means is that we will give up some of those things. That we will be called to lay those down now so that we receive them later. Following Jesus means that we will encounter Troubles, tribulations, pushbacks as we go through life in this world. You see, the way of Jesus, it goes against the way and the will of the world. I like the way that Philip DeCourcy says it. He says, to become a disciple of Jesus costs you nothing, but to be a disciple of Jesus will cost you everything. And that's the truth of following Jesus. The Bible tells us that we're to count the cost. Following Jesus flies in the face of the current of the world. And when we stand in its way, the world does not like it. And so what you've got to understand is that you, be, you will be called to walk the path that Jesus walked. Just like Simon followed him, you also must follow him. That you're going to be called to stick out. You'll be called to be rejected. There will be seasons in which you'll endure shame for the sake of walking in the way of Jesus. It will cause trials. It will cause dissensions. It will cause disruption to your life. And church, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to decide, is he worth it? Following Jesus is the crucifixion, I almost said it again, crucifixion of the self. Following Jesus not only goes against the ways of the world, but following Jesus will also go against your own sin nature. And sometimes that's the hardest thing, isn't it? You know, when you have moments where you have to make a stand publicly in business, sometimes something comes together, God gives you what you need, but sometimes it's crucifying your flesh that's difficult. And that, that is a daily pursuit. To follow Jesus will require you to resist the pull of your flesh, to restrain your anger, your lust, your selfishness, your hatred, and even your desires. And, and you will resist them even to what sometimes feels like a near-death experience. Colossians 3 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, 
seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Following Jesus is to do exactly what Simon did, to take up our cross and to walk his path. And my question is today, are you willing to do that? You know, fortunately, in our nation, we've not had to do that that much. But the day is coming, and the days are unfolding where that is becoming more and more commonplace. What will you do? Are you willing to walk that path? Philip de Corsi said this. He said, let us not have a faith in which Jesus does all of the dying. We are called to die to ourself to follow Jesus. Number two, following Jesus means that we will walk the path of unexpected suffering. One of the most striking things of this, this whole story is that Simon, he, he, he didn't bargain for this. He, he, was really, he was really trying to go and do a good thing to honor the Lord, to, cel- to celebrate Passover. And yet this This struggle, this suffering, it came on him unexpected, and that's what happens to us. The fact that Simon was chosen so suddenly and unexpectedly, it illustrates that we don't always get to choose the moment of our cross-bearing. And often when that time comes, it takes us off guard. We can feel shock. I can't believe this is happening to me. Maybe we feel annoyance. You know, this really puts a damper on my plans and my dreams and my future. Maybe we feel reluctance. I'm not ready for this. I can't handle this. Maybe we feel embarrassment. I'm so ashamed to be dealing with this. What we understand is that this is natural. John Piper says it this way. He says, we don't always choose the moment of our suffering. They come upon us in unexpected ways, frightening ways, heavy ways, painful ways. Seemingly random ways. This could be a lesson that in every moment of our lives, coming in from the country, we should be ready to be snatched into the service of Jesus. You see, we don't always get to choose the moment of our suffering. But we do have a choice in how we respond to our suffering. Simon responds in obedience. He responds in humility And it changes the trajectory of his legacy and his life. Isn't that the way that God usually moves? So often he uses small, ordinary moments of obedience. Moments that you would easily just sort of pass up or or discount. But when anything significant is accomplished in your life, when you look back, it's those small obediences, those small things... Ordinary things that God uses for something extraordinary. And and that's what God is calling you to today. It may not be some grand gesture in your job or in in, in, in in the public sector, but maybe it's just that call to die to your flesh, to be obedient, to put to death those things that you inherited from your family, whatever it is that's separating you from God. And what I believe is that God will use those ordinary, small obediences to build something extraordinary in your life and in your legacy. Following Jesus means that we don't get to choose when we suffer, but we do choose when and how we respond. How will you respond? When suffering comes your way. Romans 8.28 assures us of this. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Who have been called according to his purpose. My question for you is do you believe that? Are you willing to follow Jesus? Count the cost. But take up your cross and follow him. I promise you it will be worth it. And what we see is that Simon's life, this one little sentence in the gospel, is proof that Jesus, Jesus wants to use you. And he wants to use you powerfully. 
Simon came to observe a feast in accordance with the commands of Scripture. And what he found is that he became a character in the recording of Scripture itself. He came to observe the Passover feast, but he found himself ministering to the Messiah of whom the feast foreshadowed and pointed to. He came as a Jew... And quite possibly, he left as a follower of Jesus that left a legacy of faith to his family. God uses small, ordinary obediences to do extraordinary things. Will you follow Jesus? Let's pray. And so, Father, I thank you for this account. I thank you for Simon and the lessons that we can learn from him. God, I pray that you would help us to count the costs. And that, Lord, we wouldn't counterfeit what it means to be your follower. Lord, that we would take up our cross. Lord, that we would walk the path of shame. And that, Lord... We would do it knowing that everything that we give up in this life will be returned to us a millionfold in the next. Lord, following you is the greatest thing that we could ever do. I pray, Lord, that you would gather a church that's willing to do that in the way that the Bible tells us we are. That we would crucify ourselves and that we would respond in faith and humility when we are called to suffer. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand this morning. I'm sorry, don't stand yet. I'm really misfiring this service. My brain's not working quite, quite right. I think I left it all in the field the first hour. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper together. And uh, before we do that, I, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to prepare your heart. Um, The Bible tells us that before we take the Lord's Supper, that we are to examine ourselves. And and that means that if you are a believer, if you are walking actively with Jesus, um, God wants you to be able to come to the table of the Lord and, and to proclaim what he's done in your life. But we don't do that in a way that's just sort of flagrant and half hearted. The Bible tells us that we're to come in a worthy manner. That doesn't mean that we're worthy in and of ourselves. Jesus is worthy. But that we come in a way that's in keeping with his commands on our life. And so in a moment, I'm just going to give you a few quiet moments to just do business with the Lord. To ask the Holy Spirit to come. And, And as the Holy Spirit does, as he brings to mind those things that maybe are sins in your life, those things that separate you from God, I would encourage you to to make sure that you address this, that you repent of those, that that you do business with the Lord in regard to your personal heart and and your personal relationship with Him. But the Bible also tells us that in order to take in a, a worthy manner, it's not just our vertical relationship to Him, but it's our horizontal relationships to other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. And if the Holy Spirit reminds you that you've offended another brother or sister and you've not tried to go make that right, And the Bible instructs you to let the table pass. Don't take today until you've had a chance to go make that right and to get right with them so that you can come and that you can partake in a manner that the Bible and the New Testament says is a worthy manner. And so I want to give you a few moments to shut your eyes, to reach out in prayer to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to prepare your heart for this. If you didn't have a chance to get some of the elements and you need them, just lift your hand up as we're praying and we've got deacons that'll make sure that you can get those as you prepare your heart.
Isaiah 53 says this, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we come to the table of the Lord. And we acknowledge that it's not by our own merit. But it was the incredible love, the incredible restraint of our King who left heaven, who, who put away all that he was deserved and exchanged it for the mockery and the torture that you and I have earned. And in this great exchange now, we are at the table not by our own strength and righteousness, but literally because he has carried us here that his blood has cleansed us, that it's his merit that we've been credited with. And so we gather at this table a group of undeserved enemies that have been accepted and called children of God. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And he takes the bread and he blessed it and he said to them, this is my body that will be bruised for you. They didn't know what he was talking about, but he knew. He said, eat it and do this in remembrance of me. It goes on. It says, and then he took the cup after dinner and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and they all drank it and he said to me to them this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many drink it and do this in remembrance of me and so Lord as we gather in this place, God, we, we gather just overwhelmed by your goodness and your kindness. And Lord, we just admit that as part of a human nature, we, we've taken your kindness and we've just paraded it around like rags in a street. But God, you came knowing precisely that. And that God, you... You allowed your body to be beaten and bruised and broken. That you extended us the cup. And that, Father, as we take it, we take it acknowledging that we, we are your bride, that we have been betrothed to you. And, Father, we wait with great expectation for you to return, for us to meet you in the air, for us to enjoy that wedding supper of the Lamb that will be around your table and that we can worship you for eternity. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. And God, may we not use your grace as license to do whatever we want, but God, would we be a people that take up our cross and follow you on the path. 
Lord, we worship you. We ask that you would be here in our worship in these next moments. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. And as the band comes, we're going to have a song of worship. Maybe today, as you heard this story, the Lord has brought to mind things, sin, maybe fears that you know now you need to surrender and you need to lay down. And I want to invite you that as we sing, this is a time of response. It's perfectly acceptable for you to slip out into the aisle, to come down. We make this an altar before the Lord during this time. If you want to kneel and pray on your own, there are going to be men and women that are down front that would count it a great privilege to pray over you if you need that. Others of you, you may be pressed to join this church or to be baptized. Again, slip out, come down, let us know. We'll get that process started. But for some of you, maybe you're just realizing that you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. As we took the Lord's Supper, we were proclaiming what God has done in us. Maybe you realize you've never done that. But part of the real power of the story of the Simon of Cyrene is that he was a man that didn't fit the mold. He was a Gentile. He didn't have the pedigree of the Jews. He didn't seemingly fit in, but I believe that God chose him particularly, a Gentile, to serve the Messiah, to be an example of what it would mean to follow him as a disciple. And so what I want you to know is that if that's you today, maybe you feel like your sins are stacked to the ceiling. Like you didn't come from a Christian household, like, like you don't belong in this place. What I want you to know is just like for Simon, Jesus came for people just like you. And he's here. And he wants to meet you in this place. And so as we sing and as we worship, don't let anything stop you from coming and bowing the knee to Jesus and giving your life to him. I promise you that small obedience, God will turn into something extraordinary. It'll change your family. It'll change your future. It'll change your legacy. And so as we sing, let's sing, but let's worship and respond as we do. How far, how high The love of my 
family members that God is moving from this place to another place uh, through the military and we were able and had the privilege to send out two couples in the first hour and uh, and so now we also have the privilege to send out another beloved member of our church Mr. Lou Bello if you'll come forward um, I want to be able to pray over you there he is that's always a moment of faith when I call a name out like that but here we are. Hey, Lou. Glad that you're here. Glad to see you. Um, but church, um, you know, one of the things that we remind ourselves of all the time is that we are not a sitting church. We are a sending church. And God has called us to be here. And, and he calls people to this place. And our lives are interwoven. And he makes family out of complete strangers. And yet, we're not to sit in the comfort of that, but he sends them out, and we're to be part of that, and it's part of our ministry as missionaries to places all over the world, and that is a great privilege. We feel heartache over it, um, and yet, we also feel great expectation over what God is going to do. And so, Lou, I, I just thank the Lord for you and your presence in this place. Um, God's usually you mightily here. You've had an impact as you've been here. And I believe with all of my heart that he's also sovereign over your next station. And as you go to Maryland, I believe that he has God-ordained appointments, God-ordained relationships that, that he's going to use you mightily in those places. And so we, we want to pray over you, we want to lay hands over you, and we want to send you out as a missionary because we believe that that's what you are. And so if you're a part of Lou's um, life group, if you're a deacon in this church or a pastor, I would just ask you to come and to surround him. Let's lay hands on him this morning. And church, as you stay right where you are, I would ask you to just symbolically lift your hand out front as you're symbolically laying your hand on him as I voice a prayer of commissioning over his life and his family. And so, Lord, we gather in this place and we just lift up our brother. God, we thank you for his life. We thank you for the impact of his life as he's been here. And Father, humanly, it's natural that we feel loss, that we mourn over what feels like a loss. But what we understand is that God, when you add a family member, especially in your kingdom, it is not goodbye, it's just see you later. And we will all be rejoined, either in this life or the next, and we will spend eternity together. And so, Lord, I, with great anticipation and expectation, send out Lou. God, we pray over his life. We pray over his family. We pray over his marriage. God, I pray over this next station. 
God, for his next church. God, that you would guard him, but that you would allow him to be a beacon of light wherever he goes. Lord, that there would be people that see you because of him. And so, God, guard his heart in Christ Jesus. Allow him to take up his cross. Give him the power to put to death his flesh. Lord, that he would be a light burning brightly for your kingdom, for your gospel, and your glory. And so we send him out with tears and with great hope in all that you will do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we clap our hands for Mr. Lou as he's heading out? Yeah, that's good. As they're here, they're going to dismiss. But before you go, I just have two quick things to remind you of that you've already heard of uh, in the service. And that is Resurrection Sunday next Sunday. And so that's good stuff. Obviously, really excited for that. Be sure to grab a card on your way out. They're on the tables. A uh, great way to invite. You want that to be a resource to you. And then uh, the interest meeting for the foster care is, uh, as Pastor Joseph mentioned, is in the kids' a ministry room too. And so that's all I have for you. We'll see you guys next week. Bring somebody. You are dismissed.